you have been in the film industry for for a number of years now working in in a lot of music videos working with music videos and you know as a cinematographer as well and I mean my first question goes into sort of your journey into the film industry and what inspired you to pursue that as a career absolutely so when I was um eight or nine years old an uncle gave me a a movie camera a regular eight movie camera I I had no prior experience with film at all. And it immediately captivated, sort of mesmerized me. And um, I hadn't taken any classes or anything, but it, I naturally um, sort of instinctually uh, sort of discerned how to make films. And I immediately began casting my sisters and, and, and our neighbors uh, in these live action roles, uh, as well as doing actually some animation uh, as well. And, um, did many, many of these films, was quite prolific, these short films, and then uh, took classes in Pasadena, California, which is where I was raised, uh, and then actually kind of not only honed my, um, what was a fledgling craft as a filmmaker, but also had a great mentor named John Matthews, who uh, would become a very, very great and respected animator, and, and a live action director as well. And so that, um, I began making uh, longer form films, not features, but just longer films, and a lot of animated um, uh, projects as well with pixelation, things like this. And then um, I entered high school, formed the cinematography club at Pasadena High School, and then began working with another mentor, a man named William Moffat, who was sort of legendary here because he, with Arnold Shapiro, had uh, produced some, some really large documentaries. He's an Emmy Award winner. Uh, and um, he really took me under his belt. And then because of my work with... Um, uh, Bill Moffat, uh, my name sort of, I worked very hard. I made sure when I got into the business, I just worked extremely hard. I was the guy that would say, I listen, I'll do anything. I will scrub toilets with a toothbrush. I'll do whatever I have to do. You can count on me to do that. I'll be the first one there, the last one to go. So my name circulated fairly um, broadly within the industry. And I found myself uh, having to turn down work. I was just working all the time as a production assistant, moved up to a production coordinator, moved up to production management, and as a first assistant director, uh, and then when I was 20, uh, a TV station, uh, KABC Television here in town, asked me to direct uh, some segments for a show called Hollywood Close Up, which was sort of a celebrity magazine show. I did that. And then that um, short version following that is that I, uh, uh, I, I happened to work with a great cinematographer called Jordan Cronenweth on a commercial and this commercial uh, was, uh, now Jordan was legendary for like Blade Runner, Altered States, just easily one of the greatest like five cinematographers ever to live. And that then, and he became sort of a mentor of mine. And so that pivoted me into cinematography. Uh, I began looking for and found some um, independent uh, genre films as a cinematographer. So horror films, action films, war films, things like this. Um, and that really launched my career uh, in features. And I, I began uh, to become a, um, I guess you'd say a fairly prominent genre film cinematographer. And because you, you've worked primarily as a, a cinematographer and, you know, this is sort of your first feature debut as a director and a writer with Steal Away, how do you approach the material, um, you know, coming from that cinematography background, does that change your view on it at all? Or are you still like, are you thinking of it as a cinematographer? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, a few things, even as a cinematographer, I, I always uh, shot for the editor, um, just always aware of it because I'd been a filmmaker and I had directed just, um, you know, small short films and, and whatnot. So I always, uh, even as I shot, thought like an editor, um, I was able to intuit my, my directors very well. In fact, for example, one of my directors, a legendary Indian director called um, Jagmohan Mundra, who had come to the States to uh, just sort of uh, launch a, a stateside career uh, on a feature film we shot together. He broke his leg during production and actually uh, disappeared uh, for some days in the hospital. Um, and so I had to sort of direct in his stead. And when he got back, he was not able to look through the camera uh, at all. So I was able to really sort of discern what he would want and to and to think like, um, of course, a director then, but also for the editor. Um, so that was always um, in my mind, coverage, um, the ability of the camera to uh, create certain emotional effects, both compositionally and with respect to lighting. Um, and then 
to what bridges uh, where I was with Steal Away. And first of all, I, I'm an avid narrative reader. I, I love literature. So I'm reading about stories and their structure, character development, character arcs, intertwining arcs, surprises, things like this. These have always been very, very rich in my mind. And I had long sort of written privately. Well, um, I was on a shoot uh, and uh, early in, when I, in, my uh, in my 20s, I suppose it was late 20s, and I encountered a music video producer uh, at a payphone by chance, actually. And to make a long story short, that resulted in my sort of moving into music videos, not only as a, a cinematographer, but also as a director editor. Uh, so I would direct many, many, many music videos, and I would always uh, direct my work and direct the talent, of course. I would also edit my own work. Uh, and uh, I would shoot my own work as a DP, as a director of photography. Uh, and I would also um, sometimes even compose music. Uh, I, did, I did a Tupac music video where I composed additional music in a soundtrack-like form for that. So my work as a director had, you know, was sort of burnished in music videos. Meanwhile, I've, I was very aware that I was wanting to transition out of music videos to direct films uh, theatrically. And uh, it just took time to find the content that I wanted. I specifically, I was doing at that time a lot of sort of very dark and edgy content, which I guess in and of itself was sort of, you know, scintillating and very exciting and there were awards and all this. But at the end of the day, um, with the tragedies that are befalling our world and country in terms of violence, uh, in terms of just uh, despair, you know, suicide rates are just raging and approaching all time highs among young people, especially it became very clear to me that I had to make a pivot in my own work. And so I had to set aside all of that, then began looking for a theatrical feature, a property that would be a good, um, uh, uh, that would make a great script. Finally found Dark Midnight When I Rise about the Fist Jubilee Singers, saw its beautiful uh, racial, uh, race reconciliation implications. Uh, and it's um, beautiful themes of, of redemption and hope. And a, a Gen Z, a very mixed Gen Z group that are the protagonists of this story that are changing the world. The fact that it's not just United States based, but that it actually traveled the, U, uh, the, the Atlantic, crossed the Atlantic and went to the UK that it involves Queen Victoria, President Ulysses S. Grant, Emperor of Germany, the Queen of Holland. And so over about 135 drafts of the script because it's an epic story. It's like a Schindler's List or a Saving Private Ryan, Dances with Wolves, a Titanic of that sort. Uh, that then uh, sort of, if you will, uh, honed then my storytelling approach to this story. Uh, and uh, I believe has sort of prepared me now to, and we're casting right now. And the, the beautiful thing is the relationship. The artists have told me that they already feel they have a relationship with the director through the screenplay. Uh, so uh, those things have sort of uh, evolved to bring me to this point of uh, being ready to direct this film. And speaking about, um, you know, Dark Midnight When I Rise and of course the Fist Jubilee Singers, what else can you tell us about the film, the, the film that's upcoming? So we're still sort of in pre-production just now. So where, where are we at at this stage? Sure, sure. Well, the, the story in a nutshell, in a few sentences, is it, it's the amazing true story of uh, a sensational young choir of former slaves who are fighting the Ku Klux Klan's reign of terror against their schools, including the fledgling HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, there, there, there was a reign of terror uh, that these supremacist groups unleashed against these schools for former slaves because they wanted to find a way to legally re-enslave them through a loophole in our 13th Amendment. Uh, and so this choir rises up to fight back when these campuses are under attack, and uh, and they do, and they um, steal away follows their sort of titanic rise as they rise from slavery to the glittering ballrooms and throne rooms of Europe uh, as they conquer the world and then have to conquer their own demons. Uh, it's an amazing true story. Uh, so it was it was a no brainer that this has to be on screen. And it's amazing, by the way, that some of the most amazing stories on screen, Lawrence of Arabia, you know, Braveheart and Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan, A Beautiful Mind, these stories were out there, you know, for the taking for a long time before someone finally said, hey, let's actually put this on screen. So it's, it's, a, it's a no brainer. Uh, and so where we are now is we, normally what happens is you procure all of your financing. And once that's done, then you launch your pre-production. Then you start to 
get serious about the project. We're doing just the opposite. Um, we are still engaging our investors right now. We've raised some financing. We have a ways to go. Uh, there's a lot of excitement right now, fortunately, about the project. So even as we are shoring up our financing for the film, we've already launched our casting call. We've already uh, commenced pre-production. Um, we've cast some pretty extraordinary leads so far, including some from across the pond and in the UK uh, and some American as well. Uh, and um, we are about to make another two announcements in terms of casting over the next couple of days. And uh, we are now about to start crewing. We're about to really look to various um, festivals that are taking place in England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and Australia, New Zealand, and, and various countries of Africa here in the States and Canada, South and Central America, and in Asia, because part of our commitment is breaking brilliant, undiscovered talent. Um, whereas the studios and the networks, um, you know, they're very sort of loathe and reluctant to entrust lead roles especially, and certainly department head roles, or cinematography, production design, costume design, to those that, that aren't like, um, uh, don't have storied credits already. But we know that some of the most extraordinary talent because of the industry's reluctance has yet to be discovered. Uh, I mean, when Squid Game came out, who would have thought that this, this, this story featuring these artists who happen to be speaking Korean with a Korean story would captivate the world? Uh, Bridgerton didn't have names as far as talent that most of the world knew about. Neither did Hamilton on stage. So we know the most amazing talent has yet to be discovered. They're there. They're already amazing. People local to that talent, not only in terms of actors, but cinematographers, production designers, costume designers are already there and working. So we're now about to launch our crew call to burrow into these sectors of cinematography, costume design, production design, visual effects, editor, and to find additional composers as well. And that's the stage we're at now. In other words, we're launching full bore uh, our, uh, our pre-production and uh, we're gonna be recording this soundtrack with a global choir and a global orchestra and invite and, and with global soloists as well and inviting artists and everyday people who happen to be amazing singers uh, or musicians, instrumentalists uh, from around the world to, to actually play a role in this global choir for the soundtrack. So we're going, it's all guns blazing right now, even as we uh, wrap up our financing for the film. And, you know, touching on it there, it's, it's a very unique process that you're going through with casting because it's people who, Aren't, aren't well known at all really and you know some of them don't have agents you're kind of it's a very very much an open casting call by definition really um so what is the importance for yourself can you tell me a little bit about the the importance of opening up the platform in this way and how can this approach be implemented across a wider scale for the industry absolutely this is waiting to happen um it's it's both uh, selfless and incredibly selfish. Um, every artist, whether you're an actor, and by the way, we think this is the way it ought to be on Wall Street here in the United States and in the business sector in general, the most promising, the most extraordinary, the most exquisite individual should be the one brought on for that role, whether or not they're known. Um, that just, there ought to be a fairness uh, and, and equity, a parity in the industry. Uh, and we firmly believe that. So, um, for example, and by the way, some of the most extraordinary artists on screen were quote unquote unknowns. I don't even care for that term, but unknowns. I mean, um, uh, Mary Poppins was Julie Andrews, a very first role on screen. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio wasn't uh, a celebrity at the time Titanic came out. And these were be beautiful and bold casting moves. Um, Harrison Ford was working as a carpenter when he was cast uh, as Han Solo in the first Star Wars. And Again, it was a brilliant casting move. And we're seeing by Squid Game, we're seeing by Bridgerton that the people of the world have far more open eyes than the industry does. They just want to be dazzled by great talent and not necessarily, and certainly there's something about celebrity fame and, and certainly it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an investment hedge. It hedges your investment because you can be sure that they'll bring in a certain amount of money. And also some, some A-list artists are simply brilliant. And should be cast in certain roles. Um, Renee Zellweger was not uh, known at the time of her casting in Jerry Maguire. In fact, it's really uh, interesting to read the director's own uh, memoirs about the casting of Jerry Maguire. She was unknown and, and, and wasn't going to get that role, but brilliantly she was cast. That's the way it ought to be. Um, there are so many amazing actors and actresses who are working hard, holding down one or two day jobs 
that they frankly can barely tolerate so that they can at night go to that stage, for example, and work. They pour their blood, sweat, and tears out. They create memorable characters. The local press are aware of them. The local public are aware that they're amazing, but they couldn't get a meeting in Hollywood if their lives depended on it. And that's just categorically unfair. This is the way the industry should work. And the, and the world is already saying, hey, we're we're looking far beyond just the corridors of William Morris Endeavor and ICM and, and, and UTA and CAA for talent. So we are breaking brilliant undiscovered talent. Now I say it's, it's both selfless and incredibly selfish. Uh, we are passionate about, just I can tell you that uh, we haven't yet told him yet, but uh, in about four hours, we're gonna let a particularly extraordinary Canadian actor, a young man of color, we're gonna let him know he's been cast in one of the pivotal roles in this film. That's our pleasure to do that. And we want every one of our films to be replete with extraordinary talent that the rest of the world shut out. And the reason I say it's incredibly selfish is that we want this film and all of the films that we do at Realm to be replete with the most amazing artists, irrespective of their star meter, irrespective of their fame, quote unquote, um, we want the most scintillating, electrifying talent. And that means we're not going to just do the cop-out thing and just try to go just to the major agencies. We want to see those artists that are working in, uh, in, in theater, that have done short films, or maybe that have had small roles in episodic television, but still aren't represented. It's going to be our privilege. Um, as a final point of reference, I'll mention that we um, had a major gift by the nation of France some time ago, and we call it our, our Statue of Liberty. Um, and for the Statue of Liberty, which is, of course, it's, it, it's a woman with a torch, um, a wonderful young poet named Emma Lazarus was commissioned to write the poem that would go on the base uh, of the Statue of Liberty. And in summary, what that says is, uh, listen, you storied, pompous, uh, rich nations and lands uh, whose shores, you know, only welcome the affluent. And I'm really, really paraphrasing this kind of horribly, frankly. But listen, you, you keep your pomp and circumstance. You keep your wealth. Send us your rejects. Send us those uh, that are looking for opportunity, that are desperate for a chance. You send them to us, and we lift our torch to them. And it's a powerful statement, and that's uh, what we stand for is Realm Pictures. We want to take extraordinary artists who are, who, are, who are amazing. It's just that no one's looking out for them uh, or opening a door for them. We want to open up these floodgates and bring these artists into the fold. And we know they're going to electrify audiences around the world. So it's our privilege to do this. And it's our passion about and commitment to do this. And has that brought forward some any challenges at all? Um, has it delivered a lot of setbacks when it comes to production or you know have you, have you looked at it and thought oh god what, what are we doing here yeah absolutely uh it, i've i've said in uh, various live streams that the making of steal away will be uh, uh will go down as being as epic as steal away itself um yes on many fronts this rankles agents and i'll give you an example the way agents work agents uh i mean we all know this agents and managers work as sort of centuries and sentinels uh, for their talent. They stand in the front and they basically tell everyone, filmmakers, you're not going to get to our talent unless you offer us the right deal, unless you're fully funded, and otherwise you won't get to you won't get to our um, our artists at all. They stand as a firewall between opportunity and their artists. Um, and that in and of itself, by the way, shuts a lot of actors off from opportunity uh, to even be put up for certain roles. What we've done is we put the script right there on the website. If you go to Realm pictures.co or stealawaymovie.com. The script is right there. The opening scene's right there. And we've had, I want to say about 120,000 uh, people reading this. And so what's happened uh, often is actors, even some fairly prominent actors have read this on their own and have come to us saying, you know, uh, I want to be considered for this. And their agents aren't too happy about that. Uh, we literally just had a correspondence with an agent <laughs> who told us last Thursday about a particular artist that we love very much. And she's absolutely sold out for this project. Her agents, and, and we were communicating with her directly at first because she reached out directly to us because of uh, our website and whatnot. And because she had read the script, et cetera. And that's something else, we're turning everything inside out. The world can read the script up front. We want the world to partner with us in the making of this film. So great. She wants to do this. Uh, we want her. So we then went to her agent. Um, 
her agent said, oh, well, get back to us when you're fully financed. And we said, uh, your artist actually already uh, wants to do this film. And, and the agent was like, you've already met with the artist? And I was like, yeah, we've met and uh, she's, she's on board. And they don't like that too much. But again, that's taking the power structure out of the hands of those that would you know, like those firewalls. On another front, this was a huge thing. When we initially launched uh, the casting call, and, and again, what we're doing, as we say, is making cinema of the people, by the people, and for the people. We are bringing the people into the filmmaking process from day one. We're, you know, uh, it used to be that, that restaurants, especially your, 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 you know, highly ranked restaurants would wall off the kitchens from the guests because it was all proprietary, what happened behind the scenes. But then restaurants, at least here where, where we live in Los Angeles, began knocking down the walls and giving customers actually a direct visual access to what was going on that's what we believe in so uh again we we put the script out for the whole uh for the whole uh world to see and so a major blow up happened when um we initially launched our casting call and the the world's biggest uh casting call uh, it's called a breakdown service where they put out the rules for the different actors so that actors can you know and their agents can, can see the rules. It's called Breakdown Services here in, in Los Angeles, and it uh, goes out to actors around the world. And uh, we had prepared, um, uh, we let them know that we're not fully financed. Uh, we'd set up an account with them. Our casting director had, we'd done our, our, all of our due diligence. They had all of our information. And we started by launching just the first uh, 12 roles of 65 roles in the film. We immediately got back over or roughly 15,000 requests uh, from agents for their actors to audition. It was, it was an immense success. At the same time, we heard from two very furious agents, one in London, one here in Los Angeles that were outraged that uh, first of all, our materials were already out there on the website so that their, their clients had direct access to the material and the agents couldn't serve as the intermediary. And two, they were outraged that what, you're not fully financed? And so they let us know they were gonna to complain to Breakdown Services uh, and uh, very, very loudly. The next thing we know, we were shut down by Breakdown Services completely. Uh, and uh, they reverse course, shut us down without even the ability to communicate to those agents and managers 15,000 requests to submission that no, 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 the production's still going on. They're shutting us down. There was no way to communicate with them. So it created a whole furor. I can literally say around the earth because we had people that wanted to audition from Australia, New Zealand, throughout the UK, South America, Central America, because we were really looking for strong diversity and they had no way of knowing what happened. It was just the thing just evaporated. That was a, a huge, uh, bigger than a kerfuffle. It was, it was, it was quite huge. Uh, and, and so that's the main thing we already, and the other thing that, that has really rankled uh, much of the industry is that because we want to reach those actors and actresses that are systemically shut down from, from even auditioning, from finding out about, and let alone auditioning for some of these really strong roles in the industry. And when you get used to being shut down, you just don't even subscribe to those services anymore because you know that you're not going to be considered. There's no real chance of you. And by the way, also what happens in the casting process is if a casting director gets a whole ton of auditions, they're probably going to watch the ones that come in from the major agencies first. And when they find the person they like, they'll probably stop the casting process. So even if there are other actors that are not rep by a major agency, it's, it's, it's far more likely for them not even to get their audition seen. Anyway, all this to say, uh, when we were in the, um, uh, oh gosh, I lost my train of thought. I was talking about the international and the casting. Uh, oh yeah. So because when you're an actor who is, you're used to being excluded, you know, you know that that's a club you're not welcome uh, at. So um, what we've done then is not only cast through the traditional breakdown services, again, then we were shut down by this one particular one, but we have also cast directly through social media, directly through TikTok to reach actors and actresses that are working hard, but at the same time have no chance of getting in and getting considered in the mainstream industry. That has rankled casting directors um, who have been offended that we would buy and, and see the, the sort of danger there is it disrupts the power structures. Casting directors and agents stand as sentries, if you will. And this sort of puts us open to the public and says, hey, listen, come one, come all. We will look at your audition. Um, and even if you don't have acting experience, audition anyway, because again, some of the most electrifying uh, characters that have been created on screen have been created by uh, first timers. 
So we're open to that. So absolutely, to answer your question, Jenna, it has been uh, quite uh, quite a disruption. Uh, there has been a lot of pushback, but what's really exciting is the people themselves. We have done about maybe 10 or so live streams with, with audi uh, uh, audiences and the public around the world. I can't tell you how many artists have broken down in tears just because they have never experienced filmmakers really concertedly reaching out to them in such a proactive, defiant way and actually giving them a chance. And I personally talk to uh, many, many actors personally just to, I've given uh, directors notes as to how to approach the reading of a certain role. So in other words, I'm, I'm equipping them to succeed, which the industry doesn't do as well. Usually as an actor, you see a breakdown, it's got a description of the character, you show up for the audition with little information. And they don't give you the script, so you don't have context, and you show up, and you, it's either hit or miss. And that is completely unfair. Now, if you're a celebrity, they're going to let you read the script, probably. Um, and you're going to get a sense of context, and they're going to be much more accommodating with respect to you. But Mary, actress, or Joe, actor, is not going to get that same consideration. So I'm taking meetings with the actors to coach them even in the preparation for their reading and leaving videos as to how to approach the readings of different characters, the context in which these characters unfold, what their arcs are, so that I can really equip the artist to give their best informed audition. And again, it's, it's selfless on one hand because um, we really wanna give you the opportunity to really, really contend for the role, but it's also incredibly selfish because we are gonna electrify the world with some of the most extraordinary artists that you've ever seen on screen. So it, it makes for a great film at the same time. And what is sort of the importance of keeping and preserving this authenticity on screen and, you know, keeping it with the actors and the crew? What for you, like, how do you sort of approach that? Authenticity in terms of the historical? Yes. That's a very, very, very good question and a very relevant question here. So some of the greatest stories ever brought to the stage or to the screen have used uh, uh, history uh, they haven't enslaved themselves to literalistic history, but they've created historical fiction. Uh, and they have actually been using his history as a springboard. They actually tell far more relevant, deeper, more emotionally uh, and thoughtfully impacted stories. So for example, Shakespeare himself uh, in, in um, uh, Henry VIII, in Macbeth, in Richard III, he didn't just go back to the old annals and the chronicles and just retell things like a historian. He uses these figures to tell stories that you and I can relate to. So that these stories, and even now with Shakespeare, these figures live and breathe actually for us. A Beautiful Mind, Braveheart, um, Lawrence of Arabia, many other stories, they, they're wise enough that they create immediate emotional, heartfelt uh, sorts of narratives for us. And that's what we've done with Steal Away as well. So the characters, most of the characters in Steal Away are literal characters that existed. We have their diaries, we have memoirs, we have contemporaneous news accounts of them. So there's a lot of material. Andrew Ward himself as the author of Dark Midnight When I Rise is an extraordinary historian, very thorough, very meticulous. And he spent a lot of time carefully researching the story. And at the same time, the, the stories, but not everything is captured in a memoir. Not everything is captured in a journal. Not everything is, is captured in a newspaper you know, hearts beat and fears run and blood is shed between lines of history. And so we've taken each of these characters and have woven them into here and now 21st century characters that are very much like you or very much like me or like people that we know. So chances are within Steal Away's very large sort of landscape of characters, you will probably, um, no matter who you are, will probably find yourself in or close to this story. Uh, we have someone who, uh, a young man who is um, uh, just, uh, he has all these ambitions for himself. He has these high hopes for himself, but he seems to be his own worst enemy. He seems to blow it and blow it and blow it so much that he almost hates himself, actually. And, and we almost um, were tempted to give up on this young man whose depression grows and grows and grows. And then something kind of happens in act three that, that turns that around. The opening shot of the entire movie is a suicide attempt. And that there is an, is an arch and an arc that, that unfolds and comes back later in act three, almost uh, cyclically to a suicide attempt. And there, there is a life of struggle, of striving, of disappointment, of hope and of frustration in, in, the, uh, in between these two points. 
So these are you and me. Um, these are, if you're, if you're Gen Z and you're just, you're furious at the state of the world, you feel like you're straitjacketed, that you have no hope, you have no future. And so you're, you're increasingly thinking, which many are, that I just need to check out. There's no, there's no place for me here. Uh, you will find characters that will inspire you, uh, that will give you hope in the story. As far also, and those are the characters. Um, it's us. This is us, if you will. And then as far as the actual story itself goes, um, this is on one hand, you know, Braveheart was a beautiful film by example, because ostensibly it's a film, it's a story that took place many, many hundreds of years ago, of course, in, in Scotland. And um, But at the same time, it's very much, it's very 20, 20th century in terms of humor, uh, you know, you have the the uh, Irish army that's mooning, lifting their you know their, their 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 clothing and mooning the English army. Totally contemporary humor, and that's really really beautiful. Likewise, Steal Away is not sort of a dusty old period piece. It's a here and now story with humor and romance, laughter. Certainly, much of it's harrowing, uh, and also what we've done is taken Steal Away itself takes place as a prologue in 1853. Most of the of the here and now story takes place from like 1871 to 1874, but we have actually folded centuries of striving for freedom of struggles that that precede this time and the roughly century century and a half that have followed that time. We've actually folded those events and those realities actually back sort of into this uh, this window of time. So that what you experience in Steal Away is really an allegory. It's historical allegory, if you will. It's very real. It's historical. It's just that that history uh, exceeds the literal bounds of the years in question to encompass the sweep of the quest for freedom. And, you know, with that, it, it's not your typical historical feature at all, really. So how did that, how did you come about establishing that tone? And what was the reason you, you chose to stem away from that? Absolutely. So um, the, his, the, the history itself is so extraordinary and it's so fascinating and the character arcs are so compelling. And what, um, you know, for myself as an American, you know, I wasn't aware of, and I think most Americans are not aware of what this period of time following the Civil War really was. We didn't really realize that this was a second Civil War. It was bloodier than the Civil War. It's the birth of terror on American soil. And, and so all this to say, on one hand, one would think, well, let me just sort of stick to that story. Let me tell this as a, as a telling of what happened then and there, because that's, that's, that's so unknown. But as, this, as these characters were developed, as the arcs were developed, and the interacting arcs were, were unfolded, it became clear that the story was, was so much greater and so much more universal. And, you know, when the Jubilee Singers got to um, Ireland and Scotland, for example, uh, so first they were trepidatious about crossing the Atlantic at all. There, there was no reason to believe that this music, these incredible songs, the spirituals of faith and freedom and of, of, of hope, there was no reason to think that they would connect with, um, with Europe um, because, you know, obviously the UK's experience with history was different from the US's and the UK, of course, did away with slavery long before um, and were much, much more advanced, which was a theme in, in this. But there was, there, there was that immediate connection and yet what uh, the Jubilee Singers found was incredible kinship with the Irish and kinship with the Scottish. And, and so it was clear, and, and the themes that, that the Irish and the Scottish had gone through resonated with the Jubilees. There was a camaraderie there. There was a, a unified sort of sense that we've, we've both, you know, sort of, sort of soldiered through these trenches of the quest for freedom together. All this to say, as it became very clear in the development of the story that it was truly a universal story I actually, as a writer, had to give myself permission to liberate the story itself and to sort of unchain it. I literally had to put a, a sign right here on my desk that's, that, that liberated me uh, to liberate the story. Uh, and it was, it was a bit uh, agonizing because at first, you know, you are sort of vacating literal history, but at the same time, you're developing such a deeper, richer, universal story. So that that took labor. I I created 135 drafts of the script, and one of the reasons for that particular journey was to continue to let the story flower and evolve as it organically wanted to to bring us to where we are now. 
And it's been something that's been in the works for quite a number of years now. Um, and I imagine COVID would have had a bit of an impact on there. But have you, was there any hesitation when it came to creating the initial screenplay or even now like do you do you still have any hesitations about going forward with production no hesitations at all um it became clear um when i read dark midnight when i rise the story was so profoundly inspiring but also so universal that from a, a business perspective and also just sort of sort of atmospherically just what it would contribute to the world it this had to be on screen so my wife and I mortgaged our house. We, we bought the rights to the book. We began, I turned down all of the work at that point in time and embarked upon this journey to bring Steel Away to the screen. Um, I tried to hire other screenwriters for this initially. And what I found was um, that every single writer that I, I'm some really extraordinary writers as a matter of fact, but every writer was, was so fascinated by the history that they sort of, again, to use that term, chained themselves to history and they weren't willing to liberate the story uh, you know, I, I met Randall Wallace, the the, the, the writer of um, Braveheart at a restaurant here in Malibu, close to where we live. And so we were talking one morning and I asked him about how he approached the structure of, of Braveheart. And he said, hey, I threw away all the rules and wrote what wanted to be. Uh, and it became clear that that's what we needed to do with Steal Away as well. So I actually then uh, launched in, uh, the process of writing the screenplay again, 135 drafts. That took some time. Uh, but and, and, you know, meanwhile, you know, we're, we're pu putting things on credit cards, you know, to, to finance uh, the, the evolution of Steel Away. And then after all these drafts, we're at the point where we say we're ready to release this to the public, which we begin to do. And yeah, just as we actually began, well, then there was a round where we, we pitched all the studios, all the many major production companies in North America, in the UK, some in Germany, some in France as well. And every single uh, company and studio uh, turned us down. Um, there were a couple of exceptions to that. There were a couple of streamers that offered to buy us outright, uh, which we're not willing to do because we are going to philanthropically sort of donate or tithe a percentage of our box office revenues to historically black colleges and universities. And we're not going to let that potential fund be diluted. Um, but uh, we got turned down everywhere. Uh, and that was because there was no precedent for this story. And of course, the industry is very cautious and conservative with respect to green lighting uh, films. And just as when you buy uh, you know, real estate, uh, the bank's not going to loan you money until you get an appraiser that says that certifies that, yeah, based on comparables, the house is worth this much or the property is worth this much. There are no comparables for Steal Away because this kind of entertainment has always been excluded from the industry. I mean, for example, never in the motion picture industry's 100 plus years of existence has a woman of color ever led an epic motion picture, ever, not once. If you think about a, a Lawrence of Arabia, a Schindler's List, a Saving Private Ryan, a Braveheart, you know, even a Lord of the Rings trilogy, or it, it, these, these roles aren't even created. So in the studio, you know, who are interested in their investments, of course, and they wanna say, you know, are we gonna make our money back? They are very cautious and they don't see precedence and they say no. So all this to say, we had defeat left and right. Well, then we got formal box office projections, which were very by third party firm, one of the most respected in the world. And these projections are very, very robust. And then, then we started to build a team at Realm. We started to launch the process of engaging investors and then COVID hits. Um, and this is a theatrical motion picture. This is not is this is not just a streaming. This is for theaters, for quadrant distribution. But uh, of course, COVID shut down virtually every movie theater on planet Earth. <laughs> so investors now are running the other way, and we're like, okay, wow. Um, and we're waiting, we're waiting. But at the same time, we're building things up and honing an even better investment opportunity to really for this first film, Steal Away, out of Realm Pictures. This is our flagship motion picture. We have a, a, a slate of five films. This is just one of, of several, and many more films will follow. But we understand that this is our proof of concept. Steal Away is our proof that we will do this. And so we optimized our investment offerings to really maximize the potential returns. And finally, now we're at a place where because theaters have uh, reopened um, and, and, and by the way, things got so, uh, I'll share with you, things got so, uh, got so bad because of COVID that my wife and I finally had to sell our home because there's no way we're gonna let Steal Away not be made. It's gonna be made. So in September of last year, we actually sold our home to make sure we, we could continue providing seed money for the development of Steal Away. Um, the good news is, uh, and, and we're committed to it. This is getting made. 
no matter what. Uh, the good news is that the three years preceding COVID were the three strongest years for theatrical releases in box office history. Two of those three years were the strongest ever. And um, Statista is projecting that by around 2015, those numbers should pick up again and resume where they left off. So the, the, the box office prospects are really, really strong. Uh, but to answer your question, there is absolutely no way that we are not making this movie. It's already electrifying so many people. It will change and it will disrupt the way the industry, uh, business as usual for the industry and hopefully just blow open uh, those floodgates so that great talent can come in. And it, in a similar way, by the way, that the public is really breaking onto the scene in other sectors. People are trading their own cryptocurrency. They don't want some broker telling them what they can or cannot do. In the gig economy, people who have their own automobiles are saying, wait a minute, you know, um, I can drive someone from here to there and I can earn money as opposed to that sort of cab company that has no accountability. So the people are already breaking into the room and want to be part, uh, a greater part of the business structure in the economy. And we believe one of the last holdouts is the entertainment industry. And we want literally to destroy, to dynamite those floodgates and to let the extraordinarily gifted public in, both in terms of talent above and below the line, but also as far as the general public goes, to bring them into the room to partner with us in the very making of this film. I, I, I'll just say this, this, this one thing. There was a, a live stream that we, we hosted. And, and again, you can see the incredible reactions of people around the world to what's what we're doing and to how it's already impacted them. And I shared candidly and transparently that there's one, so everyone had read the script already uh, from all over the world. And so I, I, I had shared transparently that there was one scene that I sort of wrote myself into a corner because there was a certain kind of effect that was required and I had no idea how I was gonna pull that off, frankly. I'm like, I don't know how we're gonna pull this off. This um, uh, actor in Australia, uh, had the answer. And he posited this answer right there in the live stream meeting, and it was perfect, and we're going to do it. And that's an example of how, you know, if I say, well, brilliance only lies within my circle, you know, in my hallways, I'm not interested in what you, the public, have to say. I'm really shutting myself out from great ideas and the great collaboration and synergy that I could have with the very people. By the time Steal Away gets released, I want 100 million people on planet Earth to have actually participated in the making of Steal Away at this stage or in the global soundtrack uh, that we're going to be creating. So, um, yeah. And, you know, going off of that there, um, I, I imagine you had a very different idea in your head prior to even starting the, the project. So what sort of developmental changes or creative changes have you experienced through, you know, live streams or whatnot that you've maybe been a bit surprised by, but in, in a good way and sort of implemented that to the project? Yeah. Well, Jenna, these are the best questions I can honestly tell you that I've ever been asked uh, because they're, they're, they're so actually probative and, and really great. So this has evolved so much. At first, this was really going to be about making this film. It's an amazing story. I knew the potential of it. I, I knew the hope it would show uh, and the inspiration that it would give. And I knew uh, that it would be good from a business perspective. But as I began to then engage the public I began to really understand, for example, the dire need that our historically black colleges and universities uh, face, many of them face economically, many have gone bankrupt and don't exist anymore. I'm also very aware that here in the States, for example, Wall Street uh, will draw a lot of their executives from our Ivy League schools. And it became glaringly obvious to me that, wait a minute, brilliant artists coming out of an HBCU or for that matter, any other institution should have an equal opportunity so that that young black or, or Asian or Latino man or woman, or even a, a white man or woman who didn't, who's not going to one of these expensive storied uh, um, uh, institutions, anyone uh, should, should view their future and the promise of their future with the exact same sense of hope and capability as someone coming out of an Ivy League school. There ought to be absolute equity as far as the sphere of opportunity, the landscape of opportunity that lies before them. And so, and it, that's very much not the case. So that became clear that, you know what, we need to really throw down the gauntlet for the industry and for Wall Street as well. And by the way, you could come out, you could have the writing uh, gift of Shakespeare, but if you're coming out of certain colleges and universities that are not some of the story to colleges and universities, you don't even have a hope of your, a page of your work being read in the industry let alone being, you know, regarded. So there's just a firewall that's up. I will, sh I will tell you one of the most disappointing things with Steal Away is that uh, every black product, every major black production company 
and, and not just black production companies, as I said, every studio, major production companies, but also let me include their black production companies. And yes, those black production companies that are run by those black celebrities that you know very well, who are always talking about wanting equality, those companies themselves, they all refused to read a single page of Steal Away because they say, nope, sorry, it has to filter through. And I have the emails. I have all these emails to prove that. And I'm debating whether I should redact them and, and actually incorporate them into a company logo for one of these films to sort of mock and ridicule the system which produced them, which shat them out. But um, so every one of them is like, no, unless it comes through CAA or ICM or UTA or WME, we're not going to read it. And I'm talking about those very prominent, those black figures that we all know who say that you know, Oscars are too white and all these things. And, 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 and you think about this, if I'm in a place where we're making a motion picture based on incredible true events, uh, which is based on an extraordinary critically acclaimed beloved book and an amazing American TV special. And we, we the box office projections for this film are quite extraordinary. The, I should say the potential box office projections are extraordinary. And where the script itself has gotten the highest coverage from not one, but two of the industry's leading coverage houses. And you're a black production company, and this will feature the strongest black female lead ever on screen. And the ensemble is richly diverse, a la what would become a great, what we would later see in Bridgerton and whatnot, and Hamilton. Then, and you're a black, and you won't even read one page of the script. If that's what this project, if that's the heat of and the thickness of the firewalls that this company is facing, then think of how impossible it is. And I've always, I've always known this, but I felt it in a searing way now, how utterly impossible it is for other promising artists who, who are not starting with that sort of IP base or whatnot, the obstacles they face. So it became really clear that we have to be crusaders here, that we have to use this opportunity to not only put the story on screen and electrify and profit investors and all this, but to use this as a battering ram to knock down those walls of hopelessness and to level the playing field. So that's one of the big evolutionary things that's happened. So of course we are uh, tithing, if you will, 10% of all of our net proceeds to the historically black colleges and universities. We think, as, as I've said, we're throwing down the gauntlet for that. We believe that every uh, uh, court, major Fortune 500 corporation should do the same, not just make the occasional donation. And by the way, some of them do great things I'm saying, but it's not, a, it's not a, a, an industry-wide um, uh, sort of uh, systemic thing to actually committedly give to these organizations to level the playing field. So our sense of a commission, our sense of um, a crusade uh, has grown more and more and more. And so that made us that, that made us say, you know, we're going to we're going to reach reach into the performing arts centers. We're going to reach into theaters. We're willing to have our. And then, of course, you have these great successes like Squid Game and you have these the, these successes like, like Bridgerton and Hamilton. And it's so manifestly clear that the public is clamoring for what we're offering. So we need to up our game really uh, in a huge way. Uh, so you're you're very right, Jenna. This um, this has been an evolution for us as a company and as ambassadors for change. and. Uh, you know, we are committed to to making this happen. Um, and part of it's just been becoming, it's so interesting when you, you've had these figures through time, Dr. Martin Luther King himself, you know, didn't foresee himself becoming sort of the leader of a civil rights movement. He, you know, he was sort of pressed into that position by virtue of happenstance. And it's happened throughout history that certain entities or individuals have been sort of almost pressed into a position of sort of being at the vanguard of something. And uh, I, I, I simply say that there, uh, I wouldn't vaunt ourselves by saying that, you know, we're anything special inherently, but I can tell you this, a fire rages in us and this team is passionate and we will charge at the vanguard to knock down those walls of systemic oppression, systemic um, uh, isolation uh, and exclusion so that we can level that playing field. Um, so that, that has been an, uh, an evolutionary process. It definitely, you know, before the film's even released, you can really feel that sort of presence of you guys making that commitment to to making a change. Um, and what is it that you are maybe hoping that people, whether it's audiences or, you know, industry professionals, will take away from watching the film or even looking at the process that has been went into creating it? Absolutely. Uh, so I would divide the world into two sectors, the industry 
the elite industry and sort of everyone else. I don't have any hope that the elite industry is going to wake up or even really pay attention in a, in a large scale sense to what's going on until Steal Away conquers the box office. They're going to wake up to that for sure. So we're not really looking to appeal to them or to engage them at this point. It's that, in fact, that we're looking to disrupt and to refine. And by the way, we don't want anyone to uh, anyone currently in the industry to to, you know, we don't want to wage war against any individuals in the industry. We want the, we want the system to change. Uh, but the, the remainder are the people themselves. And so what we want right now are for the people to engage us in this way. First of all, as a gateway, just to obviously the, the gateway social media, follow us and know that we're going to be launching our global casting call. Uh, well, we, we've launched, I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. We've launched our global, global casting call. We're going to be extending our global casting call. We're going to be putting out a call for musicians, for instrumentalists, spoken word artists, just like you, and also you as movie lovers. We want to communicate with you. We want to speak with you during the movie making process. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Hey, you know, we're kind of facing an obstacle here. How do you think we can sort of get ourselves out of this? We want the people to join us as co-producers. In fact, what we say is we want you in the producing seat with us. So we just want the forging of a relationship, which if as long as we're in a relationship and the people get our notifications, they will be uh, absolutely apprised of all that we're doing and invited into uh, countless processes. Um, we are going to be um, not only having major uh, live streams, but for example, one of the things that we're going to be inviting the people to do in general, no matter who you are, are to upload images of people that have inspired you. Uh, throughout uh, your life, someone that's dead or alive, someone in your life, someone you know of, uh, someone that you know of, um, anyone. And we're going to ask the people to upload those images to us, and we're going to mosaic those images into the screen credits of this film. So we want the the people, uh, their their experiential DNA to be stamped, if you will, onto this film. So we really just a want engagement. B we are raising finances for this right now. Our budget is thirty four point seven million dollars. Um, and so uh, there are investment opportunities that are right there on the website at realmpictures.co. But also we have a, a fiscal sponsor where people can make tax deductible donations. Uh, and, you know, if on planet Earth, um, uh, just 3.5 million people were to donate 10 US dollars, the movie's funded, we're in production right now, and this is out for potentially a Christmas uh, 2023 release. Um, so, uh, and, and just to also to spread the word, um, we're going to be inviting you into every aspect of this as richly as we can. And we keep pressing ourselves to say, how can we make uh, the people even more part of this process and even more to approaching something like a, um, a democratization of this process. So we're looking for partnerships uh, at this point with, with, with everyone, irrespective of whether you're an Uber or a Lyft driver or uh, a clerk. Uh, or a filmmaker, or a banker, an attorney, uh, an investor, uh, you head up a corporation or have a small business, we really just want to be in a relationship with you early on. We want to let you know that the walls of the entertainment industry and the walls of Hollywood are coming down. And we're at the vanguard of that. And we want you to be right there with this uh, arm, arm in arm. It's, you know, like from speaking with you now, but even before um, I came on, it's, I was really curious to how this whole process would work and um, because it is very different to anything that that I've seen um from like a film perspective um but I'm it's, it's just made me more excited to actually see the finished product um thank you so much for um speaking with me on this um I am very excited to get into it and you know look at what more can be done for, with engagement you know with um audiences um can you tell us anything about any crowdfunders that are coming forward so because we um, <clears throat> are just really at the onset of really building a robust uh, social media following, uh, we've just sort of begun this and with the live streams, et cetera. We are looking ahead to crowdfunding, uh, but we're not positioned to do that now because a typical crowdfunding campaign would, would um, last 30 to 60 days. Um, we actually have a crowdfunding sort of team that's sort of preparing our way. And as soon as we build a robust enough crowdfunding um, uh, uh, platform, uh, 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 rather, as soon as we build a robust enough social media base, we will launch a two-part crowdfunding campaign. One will be a Kickstarter campaign, and the other will be um, a, uh, a, a WeFunder campaign. We already actually have the account set up, by which 
everyday people uh, can actually become not just donors to the film, but actually investors in the film and recoup the same, take, a, take hold of the same profit participation that a major investor would. So we've actually got these, uh, these set up now, uh, but now we're looking to grow our social media following so that when we do announce that campaign, um, uh, we are ready to go and we have a, a really sort of nice community uh, that we can draw from globally because we, we want to engage people from every single planet on uh, every single country on planet Earth. Um, I'll also say that's why in the meantime, we've, we have our um, uh, fiscal sponsor set up through a company called Fractured Atlas, which is probably the, one of the prominent arts uh, fiscal sponsors in the United States so that we can receive donations, uh, whether, you know, $10 or whether, uh, you know, $10 million. Uh, uh, and the donor getting the, the write-off as well. So absolutely, this is, and the reason for us that's, that's so important is that to date, you know, motion pictures, I mean, th the global media industry is a $2.3 trillion media industry. And generally speaking, lay people like you and myself have no hopes of being a part of that in a robust way. Meanwhile, major Fortune 500 companies, major firms do. Whenever you go to see a movie, whenever you you see you stream something on Netflix, you see the names of major corporations there. But of course, you know they've obtained their branding, they've stamped their names on that, and very in, in many instances, they're actually reaping profits from that as well. Incidentally, by the way, to air a, a 30 second Super Bowl commercial here in the United States, a one time 30 second commercial during the Super Bowl, the cost of that is 6.5 US American dollars. I mean, the, the, the motion picture screen and the television screen are the most valuable real estate on planet Earth. And we want to open that up for future projects and this project to the people. We want to bypass Wall Street altogether and say, look, if you have $100 you know, uh, dollars, uh, or or $1,000 or $50, we would much prefer that you invest in this and we make this together and that the profits go to you. That would be incredible to really let the people fully into that uh, sort of investment profit sphere. So um, to answer your question, Jenna, we are absolutely looking to a crowdfunding campaign. First, we need people on planet Earth to become much more aware of what we're doing.